Well, it is now 12 o'clock and we will start the webinar for today. Uh, good afternoon to everybody and uh, welcome to today's webinar on condition monitoring. Uh, I'm Thanos Moros and I represent the IMA Key Process Division. We're organizing the webinar today. We hope this will be the first in a series of webinars on the topic of the general monitoring and we decide the subject later on or if you have any suggestions please go ahead and and send it to us the aim of the webinar is to share experience and examples on how condition monitoring can be used to manage the integrity of specific equipment and discuss how it can be used widely to manage plant performance in a various engineering sectors uh, before we start I would like to thank Noel Hensman of the IMA Key Process Group for coming up with the idea of this seminar and coordinating this event. Right, today we have got two presenters, uh, Gioti Sinha and Kenneth Byrne. Uh, Gioti is a professor and a program director of Reliability Engineering and Asset Management at the University of Manchester. He's also the head of the Dynamics Laboratory and the head of Structures, Health and Maintenance Research Group in the Departments of Mechanical Aerospace and Civil Engineering. Professor Sinha is an internationally well-known expert in vibration-based condition monitoring uh, and mechanical structures. He's author of more than 250 publications in journals, conferences and books and has given a number of keynote lectures. Kenneth Byrne, is a chartered mechanical engineer and a registered Euro engineer. He is mechanical discipline manager at the Wood PLC in the process and energy division in their T side office. A member of the IMA key and a volunteer for fluid machinery board and a process industry groups. Um, he is presented in the industry learning webinars and co author a number of engineering papers. Kenneth has more recently assisted in the development of the energy efficiency and emissions reduction projects. Jyoti will cover today the basis of the condition monitoring and Kenneth will take us through an example on how it has been successfully applied on rotating equipment. At the end of the presentations, I will be joined by a panel of experts, namely Steve Johnson, VP of Digital from Petrofac, Simon Lewis, Principal Consultant at Norton Shaw, Andy Norman, Business Manager at the Encora Energy and Uptime AI, and Richard Hellebrand, Process Safety Manager at Westland Vinolids. Uh, few logistics, please use the question box to the right hand side of your screen and type your question, whether it's specific to the two presentations or ideally would like to hear more uh, general questions as well. Um, for your information, this event will be recorded and will be available to the IMA team members in the future. Uh, at that point, I will pass on to Gioti, if you could please take us through your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, uh, and good afternoon to everyone connected with uh, this uh, first series of the seminar. Um, my topic is generally covering vibration based condition monitoring, and uh, I deliberately put some, uh, uh, the way I put uh, maybe it will uh, trigger some questions which may help to decide the uh, future uh, uh, series of uh, lectures. Um, so I'm just giving a little background. When we talk about the asset management, uh, it generally provides a good approach uh, to look into the life cycle of the any asset. So during the life cycle, it becomes very important to do the maintenance, enhance the reliability, enhance the safety, enhance the production. But it is also observed that 
a significant cost generally is spent doing the maintenance during the life cycle of any asset. So during this process uh, to maintain the high reliability, less shutdown of the asset, uh, we generally go through number of process, number of tools, number of methods are available. And if you go to the different plant, they may be using RCM, maybe using TPM. There are different number of tools also, FME analysis, uh, 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 prior, uh, risk priority number, risk analysis, uh, fault tree analysis. There are many things available. And if you go to different country, different um, um, uh, industry, predictive maintenance, uh, um, uh, plan maintenance, maybe proactive maintenance, many terms you will see. But grossly, if you look into it, there are two time kind of things. There are two time kind of things. I can say, I can give a very generalized way of saying that is a qualitative assessment and quantitative assessment. So all approach may be giving you very qualitative way of looking into, but when it comes to a critical asset, sometime you need, or maybe majority of time you need quantitative assessment. And that can be done through the condition monitoring. And condition monitoring is advanced over the decade, but if you look into several industry, when I'm saying several industry, not all, you always see there is a frequent shutdown. So this is a problem. Why frequent shutdown is happening? It means that condition monitoring, which is used maybe the in, in, within the industry, when I say industry, not all industry, several industry, they may not be using the technique very efficiently. So our idea is to identify the defect in machine or a structure as early as possible to avoid unplanned shutdown. And if we know there is a defect, it can be done. It can be uh, remedial action can be done during the plant shutdown, and that can reduce the plant maintenance overhead to downtime. That will also enhance the safety and production. And there are a number of techniques available in the market that can be used as a condition monitoring techniques. I'm just listing a few of them. And if you look into all these things, most of the techniques are non-intrusive. So you can do this monitoring without disturbing the operation in most cases. I'm here talking about vibration-based condition monitoring. But as I said uh, earlier, although there is a lot of advancement uh, in the technique of the condition monitoring, but what I see the issues in many industry or maybe several industry, condition monitoring is still not a, an integrated or robust part of maintenance team in many industry. And I'm just saying this based on the observation. I'm not saying it is to all industry based on observation. It may be because there are few things I can see here is quick change in technologies. When I say quick change in technology, I don't see there is a change in the theory or something, maybe change in the instrumentation. Because 20, 30 years back, if you're trying to do four year transformation, you may be using 10, 12 kg of uh, instruments. Now you can mobile kind of things can do the Fourier transformation. Generally ignorance about the theory. And possibly our training system. Because when you look into the uh, different kind of training, most of the time, what I see in the industry, people are going to the training of a specific instrument or software not trying to understand the subject, which is very important if you want to enhance your confidence in the condition monitoring. And that is going to be cost effective if you understand that. So 
observation. I'm just based on my observation over the teaching from the last few years and then um, working in the different industry, going this thing to different plant. I can see the lack of concept. And I'm just trying to illustrate, maybe it's an exaggerated version, elephant and blind men. So elephant may be the asset and maybe blind man is a different technique. And if you don't understand the technique pro, uh, clearly, maybe your interpretation is going to be different. You may not be having that much confidence. If you don't have confidence in productions, maintenance team is not going to be confident to implement it. So, Enhancing the confidence in your observation, in your prediction, is very important to trigger the maintenance. And what I see over the period of time, maybe over the decade, the manufacturer of monitoring system, instrumentation, they are trying to make the things very simpler. So I'm just trying to quote here the Albert Einstein quotation everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler so topic like vibration condition monitoring is a complex subject and you need to understand the theory and if you understand the theory it is going to provide you better knowledge to resolve your problem so in a nutshell, I'm just going to say it is very important to look into the four steps. Understand the object, maybe machine, structure, pipes, whatever. Understand the objective. Then look from the concept of the theory or vibrations and everything, what instrumentation you are looking for. So instrumentation need, once you know that, when you collect the data, what kind of signal processing you want to do it to get the information correctly. And once you get the information, try to relate with the theory. If you connect all these things, many times you will find solutions. So these four steps are very important to do a better diagnosis or to resolve the problems. If you, if, you, if you all having from the industry, if you look back into the industry, you will see two kinds of defect. One is the defect occurring naturally. Occurrence is naturally. Means bearing may be failing after a few years or few months. Naturally, that degradation and everything, and that you can predict. You can predict, you can plan your shutdown so that you can able to replace it. So that is a natural degradation, natural occurrence, and condition monitoring. If you are efficient, you can able to detect, you can avoid the catastrophic failure, avoid the maintenance overhead, reduce the maintenance overhead. Another, another failure, you, will, you must have seen, some machine is failing frequently, maybe frequent failure of bearing, maybe frequent failure of gearbox, maybe frequent failure of some other things. And it is very common. That requires root cause analysis to understand the machine dynamics, which is very, very important. So we are not only looking into identifying the defect, but we are also trying to look at condition monitoring should also look into what is the reason behind Things are failing frequently. I'm just trying to show a picture on the right hand side, four pumps operated by motor, four identical pump. And it may be the case in many industry. Anyway, I've taken this picture from the Google search, so it's not mine. I'm just, uh, so I just want to acknowledge uh, Google search and who's over the right source. Uh, so if you see here, maybe if you do the measurement on the four piping, uh, or for uh, pump and uh, motor, you will see the vibration are different. So exactly identical machine, but vibrations are going to be different. 
So it means that the dynamic behavior of each machines are going to be different. It because maybe the piping connections and things may be different. So you may observe that out of the four, maybe three are working fine and maybe one is having frequent failure. It doesn't mean that the machine is poorly designed or defect in the machine. It may be poor installation. And that is the observation I have seen in many industry. If the installation and things are not proper, and sometimes it causes resonance, that machine is going to fail frequently. And that is the reason why you need to understand the machine dynamics very correctly. So I'm just going to show a one simple example over here to illustrate how the machine dynamics may change the vibration characteristic and may cause failure, although it is going to be exactly identical machine in a plant. So you can see on this screen, there are five centrifugal pump. And if you look into this, the inlet piping and outlet piping, the layout completely different. That means that the support to the pump is completely different. When the supports are completely different, the natural frequency of each pump assembly are going to be different. So it means that the dynamics of each pump are going to be different. Okay. So, and if you look into the pump assembly on the left-hand side, it is a vertical centrifugal pump. So you can see it's very clearly so on the complete assembly, inlet piping, which is radial, then um, so axial, and then discharge is going to be radial, supported by a steel stool on the bottom, and then on the top, there is a motor. So it is driven by motors. It's like a cantilever. And if anybody just visualize, cantilever is trying to give, or maybe you can see high vibration at the top of the pump, so non-driving end. But during the installation, during the commissioning, the plant people survey the vibration all along the assembly of all the five pumps. And what they found is the overall vibration on the top of the pump, non-driving end, is well within the acceptable limit of vibration. But on the casing, in a couple of, uh, um, out of the five, uh, four pump showing very high vibration at the casing. This means that if we start running this machine, maybe the impeller are going to fail frequently. So we looked into why these differences are coming. So we did model test. So when we say model test, we try to understand what is the natural frequency and what is the shape of deformation. So I'm just giving here overall vibration amplitude at motor top well within acceptable limit, but high casing vibration in north-south direction for pump two and four, because they have identical piping layout and east and west direction for pipe for pump one and five. Not one and five, one and, uh, yes, one and five. And pump three, which is in the center, is not having any vibration pro problem. So it is a typo error. Pump three is not having any vibration problem. So we try to look why this is happening. And then we did the model test. I'm just showing one, a result uh, on the conducted on one of the pump in north side direction. So what we found is during from the model test, it is resonating at the second natural frequency. So RPM is resonating at the second natural frequency. Okay. So during the model test, we found if you look into this uh, north south direction, and if you see here, the natural frequency is around 20 hertz and second natural frequency is 54 hertz. 
In east and west direction, you can see the natural frequency around 12 hertz and second natural frequency is 74 hertz. Since the RPM of the machine is 3000, which is 50, and it clearly explained when the pump is running, maybe full with water, so natural frequency 54 may go down to 50, close to 50 hertz. So it is resonating at the second natural frequency. And if you look at the mode shape of at the second natural frequency, it is showing high vibration at casing. So once you know the dynamics, you know the problem. So you're not trying to solve the problem by trial and error approach. So the moment we see there is a natural frequency close to RPM and this resonating at the second uh, mode, then we start looking into where to put the stiffener to change the second natural frequency. Looking at the construction side and looking at the mode shape, we thought it is good to provide some kind of support at the bottom stool itself so that the bottom, because at the root point, if it is increased the stiffness, maybe it will change the natural frequency. So we have provided a stiffening the stool by welding a thick plate and also putting some U bolt kind of things in the discharge line to enhance the stiffness. So this is the way we have done. And after this, everything becomes normal. There is no high vibration, all within acceptable limit, and no problem found in all the five pumps since decade. So understanding further, if you see some frequent failure, understanding further is becomes important. And when we say model test, because in the industry, it is very known as a bump test, which may not be good. Because when you are saying bump test, you may not be using hammer, you may not be doing this right signal processing, you may not be relating with the theory, you may not be finding the correct natural frequency, you may not be finding correct mode shape to understand why it is happening. So this is very important to understand. And that's the reason why uh, I'm just saying it is good to have a good understanding of the concept and theory. So this my possible suggestion or action, maybe as I said earlier, it may not be applicable to every person, it may not be applicable to all the industry, but it is a general observation from many industry and people I interacted. So it is good to have a very better and comprehensive training for the condition monitoring professionals. Improve the vibration theoretical concept, instrumentation detail, which is very important because when I ask many people, what is the instruments you are using, how much sampling frequency you are using, I don't see many answers. What kind of signal processing, whether it's linking to your industrial problems or not, improve the physics when you are doing vibration-based condition monitoring, improve the physics understanding so that you can able to find the root cause so that you can able to give a good solution. So this is all about my presentation. If you have any question, you can always ask. I can uh, give the answer during, and now I'm handing over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Kenneth Butts. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Kenneth and I'll be taking you through this case study for gear pumps. The idea in the case study is to whet your appetite on condition monitoring and prompt new thinking or new approaches in the application of condition monitoring. This might mean you invest in new permanent arrangement for instrumentation on site or a snapshot approach or a one-off assessment. Choosing the right condition monitoring can depend on a lot. Well, thanks, Kenneth. How does that help? Well, it, it, it is a sweeping statement. I'll give you that. But hopefully it reaffirms a lot of the conversations you may have already had about choose and change and stop and or starting condition running techniques on your own systems. What you can see on screen is a flow chart that hopefully depicts the journey from system design to maintenance strategies. To understand what condition might be applicable to a system, you've likely discussed 
how the system will work, which bits are important. I can we afford to let some things fail and worry about them later? Sometimes the answer to that is yes. But for the other things, do you understand how something can fail? What instruments can detect those signatures? Are some bits expensive to maintain? Or if it fails, does it cost the business considerable money? If you're using condition monitoring equipment, do you understand how it can and can you react to it? Once you've got something in place, you should write up a strategy because sometimes it's not so easy to follow when looking from the outside. Within this flow chart, you can see condition monitoring, and this is the area we will concentrate on today as part of this series. So at the end of the session, we'd like you to vote or put in requests for which area you'd like to see us talk about next. We've split, we've split it out because the webinars would become unwieldy. We're going to first look at a motion amplification study that was completed for a duty standby pump set. Why motion amplification? Well, it's not so easily understood or popular, and it also complements a lot of common forms of condition monitoring. Hopefully this will get some of out of the box thinking and provide you with new ideas on how to tackle all problems. The following video is a computer generated amplified motion study. It uses high speed, high resolution camera to capture the video. How it works is the software detects, detects a repeating movement of the object colors, picking up frequency and displacement. Then by inputting a factor, say times 50, as we used in this video, it makes it look worse than it really is. So what's the point in having a fake video? Well, if you think of the movement as an accurate ratio between one object and another, that's why it's used. Here you can clearly see that the pipework is wobbling, but the concrete isn't. That's because the pipework is moving more considerably than the concrete, but it's also subtle in real life, so your eyes would never really pick it up. So this software is assisting you in visualizing the problem. Now remember, you are getting real data out of it, measurable data, as you can see there, there's accelerations, there's frequency being picked up. I bet you're thinking though, by factoring the video up, you could make anything look terrible. And yes, that's right, you can. But by this point, you've already put an acceleration probe somewhere in the skid, or maybe you just touched it with the hand as it was key, the case here, and thought, oh dear, something's terribly wrong. So you're never really pointing a motion amplification camera at something just for fun. Unless that's your thing, and that's okay. But it was used in this situation because much of the system was moving and it would have taken dozens of expensive probes like recording live data over a long period of time to get a representation of what was captured within minutes of this equipment. You can see in the video poorly designed pipe supports are reacting to the vibrations and moving with the pipe work. It's also picking up the direct motion, representing on graphs, showing the modes, etc. In this second video, the same factoring has been used. So it's times 50. Um, so if it was moving one micron, it's moving 50 micron in the video. Um, although the pipe work still shows some slight movement, it's been dramatically reduced by some pipe and support redesign. Later, I'm gonna go through what prompted the use of motion amplification study and how it helped and what the data allowed us to do. So you can see December 18 and April 19, significant changes by some work done on site. There's still a bit of movement there on the flexible clamp, but that's okay. It's important to note the cowling, how everything's reacting to the movement. That's a really good image as well. So that's a before and after video. And this was the biggest bit of feedback we got from the video. And these measurements on displacement we'll talk about next. So I've, I've mentioned acceleration and vectoring, but I haven't mentioned displacement yet. The problem with a single lens is you don't have depth of field, so you'd normally not be able to use it for displacement measure. However, the software does have a handy function where you can detect part of the image and input a distance from the lens. So field teams usually use a laser pointer to accurately measure the distance from an object to the lens and then input that into the software. As long as the camera lens is perpendicular to the frame of an object, you can get accurate measures of distance and movement of all the components. This is then very useful for calculating total displacement within a vibration. And it's handy on this image. Here you can see four measured points along the case of a pump. It's showing the maximum displacement and frequency graph. 
is to place displace in 24 micron at the drive end and 58 micron at the non-drive end. It's got quite the wobble on the go and the frequency matches the gear meshing frequency. So as you can see on that frequency graph, uh, there's probably a lot more there, but because there's such a great movement on the meshing speed, that's what's proud and it's a big peak. After the changes, the pump head was measured again. It would have been great if it was four locations like last time, but the guy hadn't been there for four months, so you can forgive him. But basically, it's telling you the same thing, um, that wherever you detect along the pump, um, it's not moving as much as it used to. So you've got 4.8 microns at the driven end and 3.9 microns at the non-driven end. Also looking at the frequency graphs, um, there's a bit of a band there. There's no great peak. You obviously still see the gear meshing frequency, um, but you also see the motor frequency, you see flow noises as well, and that's okay. That's all quite low, so it's not really vibrating very much. So why was there problems? Why do we do the study? It's important to go back to some of the history. So on the left-hand side, the triplex plunger pumps, um, they had very poor reliability and the maintenance was expensive and it's quite complex. After an engineering study, a gear pump was chosen for replacement to reduce cost and, reli and reliability concerns. In these two videos, you'll see the difference in the pump design. So on the left hand side, a triplex pump example, um, you know, it certainly did the right thing because here you can see a machine train. You've got a high-speed motor with a reduction gearbox, and that goes into a crankcase. It's got a lot of movement parts. The plunger pump is a crankshaft changing rotary motion to reciprocating plungers, pulling and pushing the fluid through a series of check valves. It's got a small lubricating dosing system. It's got fluid seals and lubricating seals. The gear pump, however, is basically one shaft with two intermeshing gears, so one driven, one driving. The gear pump turns and creates an area of low pressure that carries the fluid between the gear teeth and the casing. And it's got tight tolerances, so you don't get much slippage. So you can see on the left hand side, as the plunger moves back and forth, you've got check valves open and closing. But on the right hand side, the gear teeth are simply meshing, carrying the fluid on the outside and then as the teeth come together, it's squeezing that fluid. You don't get much slippage due to tight tolerances. So it was definitely the right thing to do for the guys on site. They were changing one complex bit of machine for something quite simple, and they were still able to attain the same duty, so the same flows and the same pressure at discharge. That was definitely a success. But after this change, there were still some problems, and that's what we're going to continue to talk about. So one of the problems early on was a failure of a weld, and that's quite serious. So we've got an integrity concern. You can see a tall vent pipe with um, a heavy instrument block bleed. So if I just highlight that, there's your instrument, well, there's your valve, then your instrument block bleed there. On the right-hand side, you see a zoomed-in photo. So it's perfect recipe for some reactive motion from a resonating vibration. So what was causing it? So some of the other failures, so loss of efficiency. Here you can see a pump taken to bits. Now the guys didn't do that on site. They don't, they don't fix individual components. Because they moved to a gear pump, it's a lot cheaper just to change the head and send it back to the OEM so they can refurbish it. Um, but on the investigation, it's, it was an idea of splitting it down to try and find out why these pumps were losing efficiency. You can see down in the right hand side here, if I highlight it, these gear teeth here, they've got a lot of scratches and scores on them. Um, so when that happens, you get further slippage. So that's why your efficiency is dropping because it's not able to provide the same pressure um, and flow the fluid going forward. Here's another example. So a broken drive shaft. This didn't happen as often, but if a drive shaft fails, there's obviously a lot of resistance to movement. And some of the other things that we were noticing as well, if we can see here on the casing, right there, there's some heavy scoring and scratching. That would suggest that somehow 
on a rather solid piece of machinery, there's been some sort of bending and the rotor started to touch the case. And it wasn't a single impact, um, but it was wear. Other failures were damaged seals. So if the seal gets damaged, the glycol flows into a oil bath that's there for the bearing. Um, the operators have a telltale at the top. So if the glycol leaches into the oil bath, obviously fills that up, it overflows, and then there's a small weep. So then they'd raise a work order. Um, and we'd be able to catch that before it failed completely. But you can see some ball bearings in the bottom left. Um, they are severely damaged. When the pump heads were being changed, the technicians noticed that the pipework was misaligned and they needed to break flanges further away from the pump to alleviate those nozzle loads. But quite often the pumps were put back with considerable nozzle load remaining because there wasn't any other choice. The system needed to be repaired and the standby pump would start to fail also. That's one important point. The system never brought production to a stop because the pumps are in duty standby mode. However, the MTBF was kind of 1300 hours. So once a pump failed, it became a race to get it swapped out and available just in case that standby pump had also started to fail in quick succession. There's some additional photos of bad alignment. Note there's no manipulation of the pump heads. The securing bolt to the bearing house are not doweled to ensure that the pump goes back in the same place as old. The closing spools are only four inch long, the blue ones. So they've got flat face interconnections with the pump body. So how could that be wrong? It has to be something else. So this shows how bad the misalignment was. Stud bolt could not pass through from one flange to the other without pulling the pipework over. Now to understand where the problem started and then exacerbated, it's worth noting that all positive displacement pumps cause pulsation. This CFD study shows that as the gear teeth mesh, a pulse of fluid is created. So um, the discharge is on the other side. So suction on the right, discharge on the left. So at the gear meshing frequency, 246 hertz, there would be the equivalent push and fluid moving. Please note the OEM words that a gear pump is a precision device with close fits of half a thou. That's 12.7 micrometers of clearance. Remember the image about how much the pump head had been moving? That was 58 micron. And the clearance internally is 12.7 micron. And after the changes, it only moved 4.8 micron. So the, together with those scratches internally and the amount it was moving, you could kind of see how wear would occur. And then of course you'd lose that efficiency. You'd, you'd start to get pump slippage and therefore the pump floor rate would drop. So the pump is suction fillers, which are 50 micron mesh, and that is a lot bigger than the 12.7 micron clearance. So they would allow particulates through that would harm the pump. So basically they're bolt catches. But upstream of the pumps are larger, more fine fillers that protect the pump. However, during the investigation, it became apparent that sometimes they would be in bypass because they didn't have duty standby and the filtering is so fine that it would blind every few months. Um, and even worse than that, the glycol system also developed a pH imbalance and the filter started to foul and they were set into bypass for, every, for maintenance every three to four weeks. So every three to four weeks, it might be two to three days that they were in bypass. Now it takes some time because when these filters um, need to be changed, they need to be drained, purged, um, and then the maintenance themselves, you know, it can take a long time. So that's why it might be two, three or four days, the filters might be bypassed and the, and the pumps were being harmed. Looking at the pipework support design, it did not really do very much to stop the movement and it even exacerbated it by having a seesaw-like effect. So here you can see a centre center pivot point support and some big heavy valves on one side and the pipework unsupported on the other. So a centre pivot point is two heavy weights either side and a constant input of vibration energy. Yeah, you can also see some tight bends on the right hand photograph. So high velocity fluid pulsating would hit a sharp 90 degree bend and then another and hit another and another and so on. So the recipe for disaster is starting to form between our eyes. So the pipework was not installed to minimize nozzle loads. The pipework supports did not minimize the impact of vibrations. And the glycol pH caused filters to blind more often and the pumps sometimes operated unfiltered. 
The pump design caused pulsations in the system and the pipework design did not, was, it wasn't optimum to reduce the effect of those pulsations. The pipework vibration became so bad, the pump could be damaged from large displacements. And when the pump was damaged, the vibration became worse. And in early days, more common vibration analysis was used with a, you know, use of a handheld accelerometer and a recorder. And that basically mapped the pipework and it gave a better understanding of where there was a continuous risk of weld fatigue failures. So after that initial integrity concern, um, some attention was put onto the system and then the vibrations were low enough that it wasn't an integrity risk. However, the pump reliability was still a problem. And that's why the motion amplification study was done. Now, just doing a bit of a comparison, um, a pipework stress or online recording of vibra a vibration analysis to map the model shapes of the system was not performed. There's an example of it on the left-hand side where it was done for other equipment on site, but due to time constraints, the motion amplification was adopted to get an idea of the modes to suggest some quick redesign um, and that's basically because of limited preparation time before the next site turnaround. The site was having turnarounds every six years. And by the time somebody got on to looking at pump reliability, there's only 12 months left. So there's only so much you could do. And the photograph on the right hand side, it's shown that a guy turns up with a tripod and his laptop can quickly take the videos within 20 minutes and off you go. Whereas the left hand side, one of my colleagues from Wood was helping me. Um, we spent quite a few hours setting up some strain gauges, uh, taking high frequency online data. And we had a computer sitting there recording all of this. So we didn't have the ability to do that for this particular situation. So the conclusion. Various forms of condition monitoring and detection equipment were used to understand the failures. The knowledge gained from these studies allowed the team to complete a quick redesign in the next site turnaround. And the use of techniques in this case study suited the time constraints. The pump reliability has increased significantly. So before I mentioned that the MTBF was 1300, and that was a measure from say 2012 until 2018, about 19 pump heads had been changed in one location for one tag, um, and the MTBF was as low as 1300, that's the average. Um, but of course, after the study, things changed, and I'm pleased to report that the first change in pump after the pipework redesign, it reached 10,000 hours, no problem. So I hope that was interesting and useful. Um, we really like to gauge what the audience wants to see around this subject. So if you wouldn't mind popping some requests in any way you like, you can email us um, or you can put it in the question box and just say, I want to see such and such, and we can take that and feed that back and um, design our next webinar. I'll hand it back over to the IMEC e now so we can field some of your questions. Thank you both. For Thank you both. For Thank you both. So we had a bit of an echo there. Um, thank you both for the very interesting presentation. We've got a few questions here in the question box. Um, the first question was from Jason Michael, I think addressed to both of you and the rest of the panel, if you can take it after that. Um, regarding operational units, what other supporting research would you include into your vibration analysis? For example, maintenance, history, work scope, etc. Kenneth, do you want to kick off with that and then Gioti? Yeah, sure, no problem. So um, for the gear pump example, there was a lot of background um, information that was taken. So to get MTBF, you've got to understand how many running hours it's done and between how many pump changes. Um, so that's a calculation there. So you're looking at work orders, you're looking at um, the corporate knowledge on site, some of the guys, you know, there's, there's nothing better than asking people. Um, so you're doing a lot of background information there, working heavily with the process teams to understand, you know, uh, NPSH A, is it actually what's is it reaching what's required? So, you know, you're looking at the process guys, the ops guys, and making sure the standpipe hasn't dropped in um, level, etc. So, yes, there's there's loads and loads of other information that go into this. Um, condition monitor is only part of it. Hope that answers it. Okay, thanks. Jyoti, do you have any comments?
probably you are on mute. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? The question is regarding operational units, what are the supporting research which you include into your vibration analysis? As an example, maintenance histories, uh, work scope, etc. You know, all kind of information is are always going to be important, but it is most important to understand uh, what is the reason for the if there is a failure frequently. Okay. Uh, we've got another question here. Um, I think this is more general one, but is also specific probably to what you presented. Uh, question is from Godly Seiji. Uh, how can you be sure that this is the vibration that is causing the failures? I think it's more specific to what you presented this one. Was oh, that the case study? Yeah. Um, you only know after the fact. So you take a punt, use experience and knowledge, um, and you've got a lot of information. The case study presentation only really feeds a snippet of all the information we had at the time. Um, you do things like Famiga studies, you do risk assessments, and then um, if you do your five, if, if you do your Y tree, you start to understand what's the most likely contributing factor to the, the the failures, if you like. But yeah, you don't know until you've done something to try and stop it if it's worked or not. And, and please report it did work for us. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got a question here from Zaid uh, Haji. What is the latest vibration-based monitoring technique to monitor complex gearboxes? I think it's, if you can kick it off, uh, Kenneth, because it's specific to gearbox, and then maybe the rest of the panel can take, uh, can give your opinion. Sorry, can you tell me which person asked that? Uh, Ziad Haji from Thames Water. What is the latest vibration-based monitoring techniques to monitor complex gearboxes? All ah, right. Well, with 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 a gearbox, because you have running and meshing frequencies, you're looking at the acceleration. So reciprocating compressors, the case, and you're looking at kind of velocity because it's it's low speeds. But with intermeshing gears, because it's high frequency data, you're looking at accelerations. Um, you're looking at on the case. Um, but with gearboxes, I would also suggest that you want to do something different, uh, which is looking at orbits on the um, on the journals and the shafts um, because that can give you a good indication if your lubrication's right. So gearboxes, they, there's, there's good API codes out there. Um, if you give me an email, I can help you out. Um, so usually accelerations, uh, thermography on bearings and proximity probes for understanding orbits. Hope that helps. And, and it's Richard Hallibrand. Yeah, it's Richard Hallibrand here. Just, um... You may not be aware, but actually acoustic emission testing is now being used for complex gearboxes. Um, sites I work with in Germany have been using uh, TUV, and they did a number of trials on really complex gearboxes, agitations for reactors, um, elevators, conveyors. And um, they've been able to come up with a technique that actually analyzes um, the defects and the advanced of acoustic emission is it, it's, it, it works on a different frequency range. You can actually pick up some stuff that really doesn't come out on your normal vibration monitoring. Um, I've got, it, 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 that's another presentation in itself, but um, it's a relatively early technique, but it's certainly being used in Germany. Uh, and if anybody wants the links, I can, uh, I can maybe uh, provide them afterwards. Can, okay. can, can I can I give some answer on this? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I think a question is more related about the system. I may not say uh, because I, I'm I'm not going to recommend any system or something. What I want to say is, uh, what kind of whatever uh, gearboxes uh, you need to know what is the speed, and then you need to know the configuration of the gearbox so when i say configuration not that i mentioned maybe looking into the number of teeth and you need to calculate all possible gear mesh frequency and when and then you look into whether your accelerometer you are using having a correct frequency range or not and once you have 
even the simple vibration spectrum can able to predict what is happening with your gearbox. Okay, thanks. We've got another question from John Glaster. Are pulsation resonators used more frequently these days to prevent piping pulsation? Andy, would you like to kick us off on that and maybe Giotti can take a turn? Andy Norman? Hi, Thanos. I'm, I'm afraid that's not something I really have any experience on. Probably pass it around to other people on the team. I'm okay. sure there are other things, there'll be other questions I can answer uh, better, but uh, that's not really in my experience. Giotti, do you have experience in that area? Yeah, I have done some work um, related to pulsation in the piping. So once again, um, uh, you need to understand uh, um, what is the source. So maybe it is coming from the centrifugal pump, or maybe it is coming because of the um, um, valve connected to the piping. So butterfly valve or some kind of things. So understanding all these things are important. And uh, uh, again, um, if you are um, looking into vibration measurement, what are the frequency appearing on the, on the spectrum to understand? And I, I may not say very straightforward answer to uh, this kind of problem is all uh, uh, related to uh, very much uh, uh, different sources you need to understand before suggesting any solution. Yeah, Thanos, and I can add yes. The, the answer to that is yes, there is there is some things out there. So uh, pulsation dampers on the discharge, but also suction. So don't don't forget that um, for reciprocating compressors and things like that. Um, so there is some cases of where you put you can put a restriction orifice on the suction side, which kind of frightens you as a pump engineer, and you think, oh no, I'm going to starve the pump and get cavitation. But you can move towards um, that that requirement without violating your know, NPSH requirements, and that can actually help the discharge pulsations. So there's a range of things you can do. Um, and the case of the case study, uh, we couldn't do a significant redesign and get long lead items in like pressure vessels, which would have been pulsation dampers. But yes, the, the best way is to eradicate the input and the failure mode. Um, in this case, what we're doing is a stick of plaster and uh, we're using soft packers and um, things like that to arrest vibration rather than remove it. But in, a, in an actual design of a system, you would recognize that and you would buy components. So you're right, John, you do that. Okay. The Richard, only other thing I'd, yeah. I'd add to that is um, I completely agree that understanding the source of your your vibration is really important, and it's often not what you first think it is. Um, so you know whether it's a due to a, a pump frequency, or if it's slugging, or cavitation, or turbulence, or valve noise. Um, naming down which one of those it is, and there's quite a lot you can do ahead of time at the design stage. Sort of in, in simulation space, it's quite widely used in oil and gas um, to, you know, identify different uh, sources for vibration early on in the design stage. So you don't necessarily have to get to the point of controlling it after the fact. There is quite a lot that can be done early on. I just add as well in the chemical industry, the pulsation dampers um, are usually specified for things like piston type pumps, but um, they're usually based around little elastomeric bags inside um, pressure vessels with nitrogen. Um, the problem with those is they're often attacked by the chemicals. But nowadays, there are alternative solutions for pulsation dampers. So if you've got a, it, there's no point fitting one if it's going to leak internally within an hour or two because it's really doing nothing. You need to get the material spec right and pick the right sorts of pulsation dampers. Very good. Thank you. We've got a general question here from Oliver Fairbairn uh, of AstraZeneca. Uh, how would you advise developing a proactive business case to implementing condition monitoring routinely rather than using it as in a, in a reactive mode for solving uh, the various problems? Uh, Steve, would you like to have a go at this first? And then the rest you can take turns, please. Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Danos. Um, so I think, again, um, there's not a simple answer to that question. I mean, obviously, it becomes system specific, not knowing what you know, particular equipment you're looking at. But if you look in general terms, 
if you're applying a reactive approach, um, clearly you're responding to failure um, and essentially um, what I imagine you're trying to describe there is you're then using uh, essentially um, condition monitoring techniques to try and help diagnose problems and failures that have already occurred, which depending on the actual equipment you're looking at, there will be a negative or potentially a negative impact, whether that is in terms of downtime of the asset, um, impact on production, cost of maintenance, etc., all of which will have already incurred, been incurred. Um, you know, so hopefully, you know, if you're looking at that and considering those factors, you've got some knowledge of failure rates. You know, it was mentioned earlier in the presentation, TBFs. So you've also got a knowledge of what the impact of those failures are, the costs you're incurring with your current approach. And then you've got to essentially, as per any business case, compare that against what investment you may need to make to implement a condition-based approach, whether that is you're looking at an online system versus um, scheduled periodic uh, vibration measurements and, and other techniques. Um, so what's your cost of implementing that? Um, and you've got to take a view and there's there's you know, good experience out there in the industry around uh, essentially what benefit you could actually expect um, in terms of better managing your systems from the adoption of a condition-based approach and how that will impact the impact you will see. So you're better able to plan for interventions if, uh, if uh, issues are occurring. Um, and hopefully also, you know, like what we've seen in the presentations uh, today, um, impact that likelihood of failure in NTBF so that you're getting benefits from that, you know, that direction and therefore um, an impact again on reducing the costs. And then from that, obviously, you know, look at what the, what the return on the investment is and be able to present that case. But again, as I say, it becomes, you know, uh, very specific to the plant, the equipment, and the situation you're trying to manage and make that justification for. Can, can I add a little bit on that one? It's, it's Andy Normand, uh, and I think um, yeah, I think you've done yeah, you, so, so a good a good overall um, yeah summary of, of the things you need to, to be aware of. Um, I've always found that um, uh, the main thing is get the money on the table. And, and yeah, that, well, you've got all the right points there in terms of being able to define what your downtime costs are, be able to define what your maintenance costs are. Um, but one thing that's worthwhile considering when you're looking at, you know, getting condition monitoring systems in is that in terms of the overall um, benefit from uh, increased reliability, uh, increased availability and reduced maintenance uh, costs, most efficient use of your maintenance. Condition monitoring is, is almost always the best route to go if, and it's a very big if, um, you can uh, get the, the data in the right way, either you can analyze the data in the right way, uh, and you can actually make sensible decisions on the back of, of that data. And the problem with condition monitoring has always been that actually those first few bits, getting the data and analyzing the data has always been essentially infeasible and uneconomic for all but the big things because they're really hard to do. But the thing is that that is changing massively. Um, new techniques around, well, so getting data, you've got things like drone technology, you've got things like Wi-Fi systems, which means that you can put sensors on, which are hundreds of pounds rather than thousands of pounds to cable it up. That is changing dramatically and you can either uh, much better ways of, you know, much more interesting ways of getting uh, condition monitoring data. And then um, analyzing that data is also changing dramatically. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, digital twins, um, visualization techniques, all of those things are making that so much more, so much easier. Um, so it should be, you know, what everyone I think needs to be aware of is that in the last five years, if, if your maintenance strategies were more than five years old, actually the, um, the potential for uh, dealing with with equipment in condition with a condition monitoring as opposed to a time based or a breakdown maintenance uh, basis has changed dramatically so a lot more of those things are now going to be feasible to do through condition monitoring very good thanks i think it's a related question to that I take just, a step further 
can I add some more thing over here? Yeah, sure. Um, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I can see a very good overview earlier given on this question. I, I, I'm just wanted to add, and again, trying to reinforce what I said in my presentation. You know, in the market, there are number of instruments, number of systems and things are maybe you can start from the cheaper option to go for the very high expensive things. Uh, but if you're trying to set up something, what I just want to say is understand the technology, understand the techniques, uh, and you need to think what are the things you are looking for. It, you may start your condition monitoring within your industry in a very much cheaper way than going for expensive uh, equipment. So if you understand the concept, if you understand everything, then then it becomes very easy. Okay, thanks. There's a related question to this, which um, I think we need to address, it is from Dimitri Moros of University of Edinburgh. To what extent can condition monitoring systems be used to gain an estimate of remaining life of components in the installation. How can it be incorporated, incorporated into the predictive maintenance planning? Um, Simon, Predict with your experience, oh, on, yeah. would you like to kick that off? And maybe Andy after that, and the rest of you? And Richard? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the simple answer to that question is to quite a significant extent, and it is already being applied um, I guess to be honest, in the industries where there's the biggest financial gain from it, um, so uh, gas turbines is a, an area that I'm very familiar with, where it's significantly used uh, to plan maintenance, extend maintenance intervals, um, demonstrate safe reuse of parts, um, and that's just because the, the part costs and the materials used mean that the the cash is on the table to, to justify the expense. But you know, with that co combination of the sort of live data that's becoming increasingly available and improvements in sort of simulation and system modeling. So being able to sort of use condition monitoring and simulation methods to, you know, measure things that are relatively easy to measure. So, you know, if we think about a gas turbine example, it might be temperatures or shaft speeds and things like that. And then make real time predictions of things that are difficult to measure but you might want to know. So you know, stress at key features might be an example, and then it's relatively simple to move from that into predictions of damage, and then into remaining life. Um, and that's something that is, I say, is already being quite significantly rolled out in some places. Um, I think there's probably a lot of benefit that other industries, other users could be gaining from those kind of tools, and it's really just a spreading a bit of an awareness that it's, it's actually quite doable nowadays. You know, it, it doesn't have to be laborious and expensive um you know a lot of the software tools and the the measurement tools the the instrumentation is now much more available and much cheaper um and i think it could be much more widely used across a range of industries okay before the, the rest of you before you answer this i will link this question to another one from tom osorio of hsc so i'll paraphrase or I'll summarize this question is there any published guidance to encourage more integrated approach, or it needs to be done specific calculations for each system. So if the rest of you, when you try to answer it, bear that in mind as well. I think the two questions are related. Andy, do you want to uh, So Steve here, I was going to make oh, sorry, a ahead, comment, Steve. but I'm happy, for, I'm happy for Andy to jump in if he wants. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I think I was just, uh, Giotti's brought up uh, you know, the point on a number of occasions. So whilst I agree um, that essentially the use of machine learning, predictive analytics, and the value you can get out of that um, is very extensive. I think the key piece here is you, you've got to actually understand essentially you know, the system you're actually applying that to. Um, you have the subject matter expertise in terms of understanding not only from an engineering perspective, but from a data science perspective, how you're using the data, um, and essentially you know, work within the bounds of what is possible. So, um, you know, whilst it's eminently possible um, if you have the right building blocks to use um, you know, data science and 
uh, machine learning to give you insights and information on remaining life. Data is a key aspect of that, you know, to be actually be able to train those models and have a healthy level of skepticism, you know, with domain knowledge to challenge those predictions to ensure that basically you've got confidence essentially in, in the outputs that are being provided. And and also for me, it's not necessarily um, you know, getting into a place where um you're allowing that tool to drive everything in terms of your decision basis. So for me, the tools are very strong, they're very capable, they're very useful, but fit that into an overall end-to-end -end process of how you're managing your maintenance and still have the still utilize the engineering expertise, the experience, the types of things that were mentioned earlier in terms of inputs around evaluating what what the tool is actually telling you um, and you know, uh, make sure that you have a balanced view on the decisions you're making. So it's an indicator that your equipment may be moving towards potential for failure um, and use those indications essentially to then drive action um, you know, uh, with the engineering knowledge, the operational experience, OEM input into that where that's appropriate before you actually take actions on those outputs. The final thing I would say as well is that you don't necessarily need to actually go fully to the extent of having an exact number on the remnant life of, of the component or the equipment. You can still get a lot of value maybe with more restricted uh, data and capability. Um, and going back to, to Giotti's point around how you actually get on that path to adopting these techniques by essentially getting a good indication of anomalies and the potential risk um, that uh, equipment is moving into a failure mode uh, by using these techniques as well. And that can add a significant amount of value without necessarily investing you know, to the full extent of trying to come up with an exact figure of what the remnant life of the equipment is. Thank you, Steve. I, I, I just to add a few more things. Um, uh, um, you know, based on my experience, um, uh, it's very subjective to find the remaining useful life. Um, uh, I can I can give um, or maybe in, um, whosoever is asking they can visualize. Let's say a machine having identical five or six uh, bearings. You may not find the all bearings failing or having defect at the same time. So it's all subjected to what is the shape of deformation um, at the machine RPM. So it, it becomes uh, difficult to apply the same concept. Uh, so you need to look into, um, again, how the things are moving or you need to look into the trend. And I may not say the useful life, uh, maybe I can say you can able to predict the lead time for maintenance. So let's say you define some uh, allowable limit and an acceptable limit. So the moment uh, the things uh, crossing the allowable limit, whatever indicator you are defining, you can able to predict uh, when uh, um, um, the acceptable limit or maybe uh, unacceptable limit is going to reach. So that is a lead time for maintenance. Uh, um, you can you can able to predict uh, on on a local basis. Again, you have to apply your engineering knowledge. Richard here. The the key thing when you're managing assets is people don't want surprises. They don't want downtime. They don't want hazards. So. Condition monitoring is just a method of really trying to predict the bathtub curve. Most of the time, you'll see nothing and probably don't need to monitor really reliable rotating equipment. But the things that are a little bit um, old, you know, old and, and getting there, condition monitoring allows you to get some hints that the, it's, appending, it's approaching end of life or at least the need for major maintenance. And like vibration or thermography on rotating hook is fine. You might do the same with pressure vessels with inspections, et cetera, et cetera. It's just one of many techniques. Um, it gets you ahead of the game. It's more a bit like a, a leading indicator rather than a lagging indicator, if you sort of put it in terms of, of safety. Thank you. Andy, do you have any final comments on this? Uh, hi. Um... Yeah, I think there's, there's some, some really good um, points there. And um, I mean, what I'd say is for some of the things that I picked up is use of those kind of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence tools. Yeah, I certainly agree you need to have the right 
um, understanding of what it is. And there's a big change through the industry now about trying to make sure that we have tools that give the right kind of information. Um, and there's a distinction really between uh, tools that, that are built for data scientists and you need a data science head on to be able to really understand exactly what's going on and tools that can be more advanced in terms of actually being able to not just do the analysis, but really have what you might consider explainable AI so that it, it doesn't just pop you out with a, you know, some, you know, an alarm and says right now, there's, there's a problem here. You've got to go and figure out what it is. It will talk to you about the data that you've got. It will um, talk to you about, you know, it will provide its own, you know, diagnosis of what's going on and be able to show that, you know, your engineer at the end, what it's trying to get at so that you're not blindly just taking the faith of some of these, uh, you know, some of these tools. And I think that's really, really key and something that's really um, changing at the moment. Um, I also would go back to the point that, you know, was, you were talking about trying to find where you are on the bath, uh, on the on, on the bath uh, tub and um, curve, um, and certainly that's that's true. How do you how do you be able to predict where you are? Remaining life is, uh, I think as Jotty said, it was uh, is is, tra is traditionally yeah, it is it is difficult to be able to define. Um, but I think one of the things that um, is is notable is actually the ability to get data on a continuous basis and analyze it on a continuous basis and provide that stuff through to um, through to your engineers, provided you can, um, you get enough um, certainty and be able to knock out enough of the, uh, the false alarms from some of this equipment can be a very valuable uh, tool. And that also feeds into having, you know, the latest artificial intelligence, which will continually improve itself and be able to explain itself and i think that's that's a key thing that is just rapidly changing at the moment and is something that we all should you know take note of thank you andy i think we've got a number of other questions but unfortunately we're already 12 minutes past the hour and i'm sure a number of you would like to go back to your day jobs uh, this has been very interesting and i would like to thank the presenters and I'd like to thank the panelists and all of you who asked all these great questions. We apologies, we don't have time to answer all of them. However, we, we are planning to organize future seminars and we hope you participate. As part of the process division group in the IMAKE, we are also planning to, to form a discussion forum to share experience, interface and network across the whole industry on that subject matter. Uh, some other mechanics here, for those of you who require the CD, CPD, please email, as you can see on your screen, Murat at the IMA key. And any feedback will be greatly appreciated if you can send it, if you make a note of the email or the email there on the web page. And, and thank you very much again for your time today and your active participation. Goodbye.